All right, so um, our today topic is introduction to machine learning. So we're going to talk about machine learning. And, um, you know, I'm gonna, what I want to do is I want to spend some time discussing some conceptual things so it would make sense, you know, how machine learning works. And then we're going to dive into very practical parts of the machine learning and, uh, you know, looking into the algorithms. So first of all, what is machine learning? Um, you know, machine learning in general is just a subfield of computer science that uh, studies and develops algorithms that can learn from data without being explicitly programmed. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more on the next slide, what it actually means, you know, I learn from data without being explicitly programmed. So how machine learning algorithms are different from traditional software. Um, but in general, this is algorithms that can analyze data and detect patterns in that data. And overall, you know, machine learning is subfield of, you know, bigger field of AI, which is part of computer science. And uh, I'm sure you heard a lot um, about deep learning, well, which is in fact part of the machine learning. So that's sort of the, that's a hierarchy of um, terminology. That's a hierarchy of sciences. And we're not going to talk about in, in this course about AI in general, we'll be focusing on that very practical part, which is uh, machine learning. Now, why do I want to discuss sort of the big picture? Well, one of the reasons is because, uh, you know, we, we want to be not only just, uh, you know, computer science sort of programmers, data scientists who can um, write code, but also you should be able to explain to people uh, you know, what machine learning is and, you know, how it works and some sort of basic fundamental concepts. Because, uh, you know, today in many industries uh, where people start using machine learning and start using data science, there is still a lot of confusion about what machine learning is and what it is not, right? What it can do and what it cannot. For some people it's magic, for others they just don't really know what it is. So, um, first of all, how is machine learning different from traditional software? And in fact, that's probably what, one of the most common questions that you get, especially from um, you know, engineers. Um, and, that, and the idea is the following. Um, if you look um, at, uh, by the way, can you, see, can you see my pointer? Can you see my mouse there? Yeah, okay. So if you look um, at the sort of traditional software uh, or you know, software automation, it's really applying rules to the data. So what it means is the following, you have some data and there are some rules that are hard coded that are written by a human person and then your software is actually applies them. You know, for example, if you work for a bank and there are some rules you can check um, you know, that, that before giving somebody a loan, you can check that the address is correct, you can check that the, you know, there is a password number that matches you know, the director of password numbers and that, for example, I don't know, the income is above certain threshold. So it's a human person who put there that threshold and who set up those checks. That's a traditional pipeline, this is traditional process automation. So machine learning is different and it's different in the fact that machine learning actually creates those rules that later on can be used um, within the automating processes. So you look at the data, machine learning looks at the data, looks for patterns and looks at examples and generates those rules. So machine learning is about creation, the rules, right? And then process automation is about using these rules to uh, perform certain type of activities, okay? Um, so, Typically, when you use machine learning, what do you do? Well, first, you actually you know, design a model, you train it, and you test it. And today, we're going to talk a lot about you know, training, testing the model, checking the quality of the model. But this is the first part. This is what happens that what you do as a data scientist, right? You take the data, you select the right algorithm, um, you train it on that data, and you have a model trained model. Then you actually can take this model and you know, put it into production and where, where the model will be executed on the new data and provide certain predictions. You know, think about, I don't know, scoring application in the bank. 
Um, what you do is you take historical data on customers, on the clients, you build machine learning system, you build the model, and then you, uh, then you deploy it. And then whenever a new client comes in, um, the machine learning model will, for example, compute a credit score for, for the person, right? Um, and see you know, if, if you can give a person a particular loan or not. So that's a traditional pipeline. So it's extremely important to understand that you know, there is a sort of triad of in between this algorithm, algorithms, data, and training process. So by itself, algorithm is, you know, is not capable of doing anything. It has to be trained on the particular data. And that's why people keep saying that the data is new oil is because um, without the data, your algorithm cannot be applied to your particular problem. In fact, only because algorithm plus data are critical, a lot of algorithms today, they are open sourced. So companies develop algorithm and they're not afraid of com competition. Well, unless, okay, unless you're doing very specific algorithm, for example, like for self-driving cars or some other things which are very, very deep. Um, a lot of algorithms are open source. And so you can take any software like, you know, this rapid miner or like, you know, scikit-learn and you will have most latest algorithms implemented in there simply because it's only when you take the algorithm and connect it with the data, it creates and can make, you know, bring value to business. Now, um, another important, very important concept here is learning. So we call it machine learning. And um, it's, it's, it's really important to understand what learning is. Um, you know, I put it here as it's, uh, you know, process of estimating unknown dependency in the structure from some limited number of observations and then ability to generalize to previously unseen data. Now, what I mean here, um, there is, we, we should understand the difference in between learning and memorization. I'll give you an example. Let's say um, I, give you, I give you a bunch of questions uh, as a preparation for the test, and the questions will have answers, and you look at them, you remember them. Then you come to the test. If I give you the same question as on the test as I have shown you before, you will just recall the answers, fill them in, get you A, right? Get you A's. Um, that's going to be memorization. So you have not sort of learned anything, you literally memorize the answers. It's going to be very different if instead of memorizing, if, if instead of giving you the same questions on the test, I'll give you different questions. Now, those questions, will use the same information or uh, the, the one that I provided you, right? But they will be formulated differently. Maybe there will be a com combination of the, the questions I have shown you before. Or, uh, you know, you can actually, from, from that knowledge, you can deduct the answer to the questions, um, uh, to these new questions. So if you can answer those, that will be learning because you learned the material and now you can generalize it to the questions you've never seen before. All right. Another example, when, for example, you know, kids, um, you know, parents teach a kid to differentiate, distinguish cats and dogs, they'll show a kid, you know, a few cats and a few dogs. And then, uh, you know, a kid will see an animal on the street, right? And he'll say, oh, it's a cat or it's a dog. Well, most likely on the street, it's going to be a dog, right? But never seen before, but from the examples, learn what the difference is. So that's learning. You know, recognizing the same cat as has been shown to you before as a cat, that's memorization. Does it make sense? Okay, so you feel the difference. So machine learning is actually about learning. It's about picking up examples, finding something what's in common in those examples, of finding that structure, and then using that structure to answer the questions that the system never seen before. In other words, you have some number of customers, you learn uh, from those customers, for example, what a good customer looks like and what a you know, bad customer looks like. And then when there is new customer comes in, the algorithm never seen him before, but picks up certain properties, certain features of this new customer, and then can predict if it's gonna be a good or bad. All right, so that's learning. Um, learning is, based on you know, what's called is you know, sort of central dogma on statistics. And in fact, machine learning is really statistical learning because um, we're not using sort of basic fundamental physical principles in here. 
um, you know, when, when you try to understand if, uh, you know, somebody is going to be going to return a credit to the bank, we're not trying to model his, I don't know, thinking from the neurological perspective or from psychological perspective. What we do is we look at statistics. We're trying to see what people like this person done previously. And based on that, we can predict what this person will do. So it's statistical learning. And as with any statistics, it's very important how we deal with samples of the data. So what I mean by sample of the data? Um, if you think, for example, about the way, say, you know, polls are done, in, in, especially, say, in politics, um, nobody actually asks questions for the entire, of, uh, the entire population questions, right? You pick up some number of people, all right? You get answers. And from that, you extrapolate to what, you know, the, the, the people in, in the country thinks, right? When somebody says, you know, 35% people or 70% approves, it's really not that 70% approves. It's the poll, right? The subset of people you actually ask the question, they approve. And from that, you kind of say, okay, well, fine. You know, I took, I took 100 people, 70 of them said, yes, we approve. Um, that it means, you know, it's 70% approval. Okay, fine. Now, the country approves, uh, you know, 70% approval rate. Um, which is, of course, you know, is, is, is uh, extrapolation and can work only if your sample is representative, right? Which means if you're making a poll only in Moscow, uh, it's definitely not representative for the, the entire Russia, right? So constructing a poll is, is actually a very, very tricky and interesting problem. Um, the same way when, when people talk about, say, I don't know, the, the coronavirus right now, um, it's also the question is how, how many people you check and how do you select those people? So whenever you build machine learning system, you never see the entire world of the data. It's always a subsample. It's always a subset of the data that you have. And um, it is subset simply because, well, you know, you, if you want to deal or try to predict something for the, for the bank clients, you haven't seen all the people you know, in the world. They never be in you know, the bank client. You only work with the people who worked with, uh, you only work with the data of the clients, of the current clients of the bank. And so um, it is already a subsample of the world population. But even then, most likely you will never get the entire his historical data in the bank, you'll probably get a piece of it. So what's extremely important is that the data you get will be, will be representative of the actual data, right? So what I mean is this, you know, you, you can look in the slide, there is a sampling principle, right? So if there is, we have a bin with say green and, 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 and uh, red balls, and we pick up some balls randomly, we want to make sure that within the sample, we have the same ratio of green and uh, uh, red balls, the same as in the vase, right? Because then it's gonna be representative. If it is not, uh, you, you cannot make any conclusions about uh, what's happening in the vase just based on the subsample, right? So mathematically speaking, it means the distribution, the histograms um, that you built for the entire data set and for a uh, subsample, for a sample should be the same. Now, since most of the time you cannot build a distribution for the entire set, you just don't have it, right? Uh, it has to be within this sampling policies that's where you should do the right things. You know, uh, you know send them, sample randomly. Um, typically, it's uniformly at random. And probably from the very different, you know, if we're thinking about political polls, of course, it should be different locations. Um, you know, probably the number of samples need to be proportional, for example, to the size of the city. Now, what's also very important, and that's usually, you know, happens quite often when you try to build those models, uh, you know, in production, for real, what usually happens is, um, you know, you, you took a sample of the data, you build your model, you train your model, then you put it into production and it doesn't work. Because by the time you develop the model and put it back into production, the distribution already shifted. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, um, you know, you try to build a model that predicts creative scores and, you know, predicts whether you're gonna give um, a a loan to a client or not, based on a typical salary. Well, then economic crisis hit and salaries changes. And all of a sudden, 
this person's salary back then when you trained the algorithm was actually you know maybe not good enough but now because everybody's salary dropped all of a sudden it is relatively to other salaries is pretty high so distribution changed um, you, and performance of your algorithm will change so the, the what i'm trying to the, the point i'm trying to make is again having the right sample of the data is very important and when you work uh, and build models you need to make sure the sample you work on is exactly the same has exactly the same distribution and the same properties as a sample that you're going to have when you actually start using this uh, you know in production okay all right so last time we talked a, a, a little bit about this uh, you know three types of machine learning right uh, you no know, first of all it's supervised learning and the supervised learning is when uh, you have inputs and you have outputs and you're given for every you know, input, you're given an output. And that's given to you as training data. Um, as an example with, with, with a cat and dogs, well, there is, here's, a, here, here is a, here's an animal, you know, here is the properties of the animal and here's the label, it's a cat. Or here is a, another animal, it's a dog. Now, unsupervised learning has slightly different goal it's really you don't have x's and y's you only have x's so you only have data points and the goal there is to try to find some structure within that data finally reinforcement learning is an algorithm that allows you to you know adjust actions based on the responses so for example those algorithms are actually used mostly for you know say for self-driving cars or for um, you know gameplay where um, the agent makes a move and then the system provides the feedback says okay yeah it was a good move or a bad move right you know you, you, you turn left okay there was a bad move you turn right it was a good move you know you shoot somebody you know in the game that was a good move or a bad move. and based on that based on that constant feedback uh, agent learns so it's more about like agent-based learning typically in business most like probably 80 or 90 percent of the use cases you see will be within supervised learning um, and the reason for that, I mean, there are several reasons for that. Um, one of them is because, you know, that's sort of the way problems are typically formulated. But it's also because within supervised learning, it's much easier to, to check and to calculate the quality of your algorithm to make sure it does the right thing, right? Because you're kind of giving it examples and you want to, and you can check it, uh, how it handled those, those examples. In unsupervised learning, it's sometimes, um, you know, there is no clear answer. There is no sort of right answer. Um, but still, there, there, are, there are places where unsupervised learning is being used. But again, you know, typically it's supervised learning. And so we're going to be spending a lot of time understanding how supervised learning operates. All right? Any questions? All right. So we're so far kind of spending, you know, we're going from the very sort of broad view of what machine learning is and, and trying to narrow it down a little bit. Supervised learning, all right. So within, within sort of machine learning, as I said, there is unsupervised and there is supervised. And supervised learning, you split into two types. There is a classification problems and there is a regression problem. So classification is when you have a label, like um, uh, where your target is, is, a, is uh, is a label like, uh, for example, you know, somebody survived, for example, during the Titanic crash or not. A regression problem is where you try to predict a number. Now, and then there is a list of bunch of, of algorithms. All of them um, can do, you know, either classification or regression. In fact, um, as we will see a little bit down, down the line, um, the classification and, and, and regression are quite similar from the algorithm perspective. And so very, very similar algorithm or exactly the same type of algorithm um, can work both from classification and regression. But typical are you know, decision trees, um, that's sort of the most classic algorithm for classification and uh, logistic regression. Uh, for you know, regression, it's usually linear regression um, that, that works very well. Also decision trees and ensemble methods. Now neural networks work everywhere the trouble with neural network is that sort of traditional, you know, old fashioned neural networks, they're actually not such a good algorithms, more new sort of newer version of neural networks that called deep learning 
just do deep learning, deep neural networks, which have sort of what's called multiple layers, um, they actually work really well for some type of problems, uh, but they require a lot of data. And uh, usually, again, they work really well for, for problems with text, with, with video, with images, and maybe not that well for, or don't give you a lot of advantages if you try to predict credit score. Now, what's interesting on the left, um, this is a poll from the website um, KD Nuggets, which is a website dedicated to you know, data mining. And this is a poll done, it's, it's not a very big poll, probably like 1,000 people, um, that is done among uh, you know, data mining, data science uh, crowd, just looking at what type of algorithm they're using. And if you notice, most popular uh, you know, is regression, like 50% of the people you know, using regression, decision trees, clustering, et cetera, et cetera. So all those algorithms, if you're not familiar with them, most of them will, uh, will touch uh, you know, during, during this course. Okay, so regression. So response variable is really real valued, so it's a number. And you can think about you know, univariate regression where you have, a, you know, there is a dependent, dependent variable and independent variable, and we only have a one independent variable. So we're trying, for example, to uh, learn the dependency of sales on amount of, um, on, on, based on the budget on a TV advertising. That's sort of what you see on the left. On the right, um, it's an example where you have also the dependency of income, for example, uh, on, um, on the two parameters. Here it's years of education and the seniority level. So these are multivariate regression. In both cases, we do have um, you know, two numbers, either one number, and we're trying to predict um, the target variable. Now, within the regression, though I showed as independent variables, I showed you um, also numbers. Uh, you can use uh, you can use you can use labels. You can use um, discrete features also in there. That's typical regression setting. Now, classification setting is slightly different. Um, here, the response variable is categorical. Features or the variable that are being used to do classification can be either numeric or categorical. Um, here's an example on the left. Uh, you know, it's a binary classification. Let's say you have two groups and you need to classify objects in those two groups. On the right-hand side, it's multi-class classification where you have handwritten digits. And uh, for each handwritten digit, you want to classify um, what that digit is. Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Now, I want to spend a little bit more attention, a little bit more time on this left picture because it's actually um, quite, quite interesting. Um, let me try to get annotation on. So um, let's try to formulate this binary classification problem as we have it here. Um, so we have two examples, we have two sets, and we have examples of the objects that belongs to each set. So um, this is sort of classical classification problem, right? Supervised learning. We have, for example, this object, which is green oval. Well, it belongs to set that says yes, right? The set to the left or yellow oval to the set on the left or red arrow belongs to the set on the right or red oval to the set on the left. These are examples. So these are objects and this is a label that corresponds to all those objects, right? These are objects and that's a label that corresponds to those objects. So these are examples, samples. And now for machine learning algorithm or for you, the task would be, I'm giving you a new object, right? This half moon. And the question is, should it go to the yes bucket or should it go to the no bucket? Like it's almost IQ test. Uh, so what do you think, where should it go? Come on, don't be shy. To the yes bucket. Yeah, to the yes bucket. Yeah. Why? Blue color. Uh, because of the blue color, like all, all, every object we have, uh, like, like all the blue object, objects are in this bucket. Right. So you're right. You can actually, so see, you can actually work as, as, as a machine learning algorithm now. Um, so the idea would be uh, the following. Let's look at this object, right? In order to, to do what you have just done and classify it, we need to understand what would the features be, right? 
the features of the object that we can compare to the features in each class. And one of the features is a shape, right? It's like half moon or, or whatever shape. Another feature is a color. So let's see if the first feature, a shape, can help us to, to put it into one yes or no classes. Let's check it. No, it cannot, right? So the shape is, is useless here. Color, okay. We notice that majority of blue colors of blue objects are in the left. So that's where we're going to classify it. Make sense? All right, let's do a little bit more complicated task. Let's look at this one, this, this uh, you know, yellow circle, right? Semi yellow circle or, or. The circle will go uh, uh, either in the yes uh, and no, or no, or neither, uh, not on the yes and no, the no. Like uh, it, it will belong to both of the squares or belongs to no, none of the squares, I guess. Uh, interesting. Uh, let's say we want to have a binary classification, so we're not allowed an answer, like we don't have a third option, right? It's either to the left or to the right. Oh, can I, can I suggest that it will go to no because the proportion of yellow shape, shapes in the right bucket in the bucket no is uh, more than proportion in the yes bucket. Correct. Yes. So if we follow this logic of like, hey, let's see, the features here are shape and color. If we look at the shape, the shape by itself will not let us decide whether it's yes or no. But then we look at the color. It's yellow, but there are yellow in both of them. Well, let's see where they're more yellow, right, as a feature. And the more yellow is in the right bucket, in no bucket, so that's where it goes. Does this make sense? All right. What we guys just did, we pretty much built a decision tree, right? We we're smart enough to, 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 to realize that these are the features, and based on those features, we can classify our object into one, or, or, or in one bucket or another bucket. And pretty much what machine learning does is by looking at these examples, it builds that decision tree automatically for you. All right? And then when you bring a new example, it just puts it in the right bucket. It can make mistakes, absolutely. And there could be situations where it doesn't, you know, it just doesn't work. There is not enough data, or maybe, uh, you know, it's quite ambiguous. For example, if I put a third yellow object on the left, right, all of a sudden, as an example, all of a sudden, we don't know where to classify this, right? And then you just put it sort of randomly in one or another, because um, then there is no features for us that enough um, to, 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 to make a decision. So, but that's sort of how it works, all right? Okay. Let's move on. Um, quite often, and as I mentioned before, like regression problems and classification problems, um, they are in fact quite similar and, and there are very similar algorithms that can solve that. Let's look at this. Um, and I need annotation. So uh, for example, here is regression on the left. Very simple. So we have a, uh, you know, by some reason my x went up there. So we have x variable and we have y variable, and we are given some value of x. We want to predict um, the value of y, right? We want to predict the value. Sort of, we want to predict what y corresponds to this value of x. Now, that's typical regression, right? So we for we have a bunch of data points. For those data points, we have um, X values will have Y values. Now, if I look at the classification, that will be slightly different. Now, remember, classification is the example we just did with those, uh, with those shapes. Now I can formulate it slightly different. Let's say I have only one variable, the, and the variable will be X right now, right? Um, you know, think about it, I don't know, as a shade of the color or anything you want. And there are two classes, yes or no, which really numerically can be shown as zero or one, if we have binary settings. And then our samples, well, with, let's say with some values of x, it's, they're all zeros. And with other values of x, with large values of x, they're all ones. So, and then I give you some value of x, let's say I give you new x, 
And the question would be, is this going to be the, the right answer for this x? Is it going to be 0 or 1? In order to answer that question, by looking at this, you realize, OK, this x is close to this guy, so the answer is going to be 1. So in some sense, to solve this problem, you kind of separate the, you know, put the separating line, and what's ever on the right is becoming 1, whatever on the left becoming um, 0. Now, this is actually, in fact, this picture is for logistic regression. And we're going to talk about it uh, you know, next time, or yeah, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the one lecture. But the point is, um, the approach to both regression and classification can be, can be quite similar in terms of the, the sort of the algorithm, how you're going to handle it. Now, oh, and it didn't go away. Um, there are some things that are very convenient here and others that are actually not very convenient. All right. So model overfeeding, what that is. Um, it is yeah. the situation when your model is uh, overfitted to data and cannot predict any snails except this precise data. So you cannot use this model to predict a, any new bunch of data. Yeah. Correct, correct. So what's model overfitting is the following. Let's say I do have um, the, the data as shown here, right? These are my data points. And uh, the, the question is typical question for regression. Let's say if I, uh, you know, ask you for a value, um, you know, for, for, for a value, let's say, you know, I, I select X to be this value. I don't have, you know, an example. Um, I don't have, you know, precise answer for that question because these are the data points where I know the answer. So I want to find, um, you know, what the value of Y will correspond to X when it is there. And, you know, one of the ways to, of doing this is to, you know, interpolating. Uh, do you guys? Is it, is it me or? Okay. Can you see? Can can you see the slide? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You hate it when the computer is doing it to you. Um, okay. So so uh, you want to extrapolate, uh, or I'm sorry, to interpolate in between data points, and the various ways of doing it, right? You can actually think of like, okay, um, you know, I'll I'll use linear regression, and then if I use linear regression, the predicted value the predicted y value, so it will correspond here, the predicted y value will be there. Now, is it a good prediction? Well, in fact, here, in, in this case, it's, it's actually a pretty good prediction. But if I take, uh, you know, this value, my prediction will be here, which is way out of, of the data points, right? Now, another option, I can just sort of try to run a very smooth line through all those data points. And, uh, then, you know, whenever I try to make a prediction, well, it kind of fits sort of with the right ballpark. Now, the problem with this is that um, you really don't know if in the real world, with a such small change in X values, right, those two points are next to each other, there should be such a large difference in their responses. It's very well possible that this is a noise, right? Or it's a little bit of random. And so the real world is actually much smoother and uh, it can be represented by this, uh, you know, smooth picture. And then whenever you get the X value, this is a corresponding to it, uh, a Y value. So the idea is, um, when you try to, to, to build a model, you want to balance the complexity of the model. You don't want it to be extremely simple because when it's extremely simple, you might, you know, you might lose important information, right? Uh, you know, sort of throw a baby with the water. When it's too complex, it will not be generalizing well because what you're gonna be learning is you're gonna be learning those, you know, oscillations 
like here, that in fact might not be you know, the, the real thing. Now, um, as I mentioned, a lot of stuff we're gonna talk about today might, 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 especially if you've never done machine learning, will look to you, you know, a little bit cryptic and uh, um, you know, it, will, it would be not clear why we're even bothering to talk about it. But you know, trust me, when you start doing those things, um, you realize how important it is to understand the right complexity of the model and build the right model. Now, we, um, the way we're gonna do this in this class, we're gonna sort of, I'm gonna introduce you to certain concepts. And uh, you know, as time goes by on the following lectures, we kind of, we, we'll, we'll come back to some of those concepts um, and reconsider them. And so you know, if some of those things do not make sense to you right now, that's okay, right? We'll come back, we'll come back to that. All right. So here is another example of this model overfitting. Um, if we take a classification, look, let's say we have two classes, this you know, red dots and blue dots class. And um, what I want to do is I want to find a boundary in between those two classes. And uh, one way to do this is I can be extremely precise and you know, follow that green line, right? This is sort of the, almost the perfect, you know, the, uh, almost, well, it is the perfect answer, right? It kind of separated perfectly um, red dots and blue dots for me. Now, the problem is, as, as, um, um, you know, as we discussed, that those positions of those red dots might be actually due to some noise. And so the actual boundary is actually much smoother. And so by specifying the boundary the way you know, I showed it here, I overfit, which means I learn precisely um, the answers to you know, the questions. I can reproduce them really well, but I lose a you know, bigger picture. This will make more sense you know, as, we go, as we go along and as you try it you know, yourself. Okay, so you know, machine learning models, in fact, there is this always uh, you know, two side of things. One is you know, model complexity. And you know, quite often model complexity comes with a better prediction accuracy. On the other hand, there is this model explainability or the way you can understand the model. And so based on that models typically can be divided into this white box models, what's called in black box models. So white box models is usually simple models where it's very clear um, how to interpret them and how to explain them. And they're usually quick to run um, and you know, you don't, they do not need a lot of tuning. You know, linear regression is an example of that model. Uh, logistic regression is an example of that model. In fact, for a lot of, for example, banking decisions, um, there is still literally law requirement that that forces you to, do, to use those type of models because they have to be explainable. So you have to explain how each uh, feature, how each property affects the model. So if you don't give somebody credit, um, you need to be able by law to explain why you haven't done it, right? So what sort of rule has been broken, has been violated. And to do that, um, you need to understand why your model made certain decision. At the same time, black box models are those models that are um, you know, much more complex, right? And you know, we'll see like random forests or neural networks, um, they are much more complicated. And even when you send a data point through this and the model makes certain prediction, it's actually very hard to explain why that prediction is, you know, again, class yes or no, right? We were easily, we were able to easily explain that um, on, on, on our tree toy example, um, but it, sometimes it's, 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 it's actually pretty hard. And so these are black, mod, black box models. Now, depending on your application, sometimes you're okay with a black box model because that models, they're more complex, they probably give you a better answer. For example, if you're dealing with the self-driving cars, maybe it's not such an important for you, for the car to explain to you every time you know car speeds up slows down turns left a little bit turns a little bit right you know why it actually did it right sort of 
going through all the logic like okay i saw that traffic light that car is slowing down that's speeding up so i you know i want to to, to shift a little bit to the left um you know you probably don't care but at the same time if you use a model that makes a prediction if somebody you know will need an icu unit in the hospital intensive care unit you know doctor need to know why the model believes that right or again if it's if it is say financial decision and so depending on the model applications um there are there are the, you need to kind of balance that prediction accuracy versus uh, model explainability um you know honestly in, in everyday life working with businesses uh typically business really wants to know uh why model makes certain decisions now some again some models the sort of white box models they're easy to explain right out of the sort of by design right like regression where you look at the regression coefficients other models are as i said you know like random forest is hard to explain just by design but there are some methods and we're going to talk about them that allows you to um, explain at least you know the importance of different variables and how they affect the result so they make those complex models a little bit more transparent and uh, you know but that's extremely important practical skills um, skill not to be able just to you know build and run your model but to be able to kind of follow through and explain for any particular um, you know decision that the model makes uh, you know based on, on, on what rules or how this decision has been made So let's look at the regression, right? And, and the modeling, sort of just very, very simple, naive example. Um, this is, you know, we looked at this data before, you know, sales and, and uh, you know, TV advertising, how much money has been spent on that. So let's say um, I, want to, I want to do the following. I want to um, predict the, the, the amount of sales that happens when I spend, uh, you know, let's say, I don't know, uh, 50,000 on a TV ad. Well, to do that, okay, I look at the 50,000, I look at, okay, there, there is data point there, so I can actually tell instantly how much sales, right? That's not a, no, no problem. But let's say, um, you know, I want to understand how much sales uh, happens if I spend, you know, $160,000, right? If you look up, there is no value that corresponds to that. So how would you, how would I you know predict sales? So what should I do? Let's let's look for like the, the most simplest thing, right? You know, we, we're not talking about complex machine learning solutions. Let's you know be sort of naive, intuitive, the same way as as we were when we played that game um, with classifying objects. To draw so, the trade line, maybe draw the trend line okay like but the trend line it's already sort of more complex you need to learn how to draw that what would be the easiest solution Let's take a nearest neighbor okay yeah you can say okay look uh what's the nearest here okay there is this nearest so i can actually say that uh you know here is the answer right it's you know fifteen thousand, or there is you know guy a little bit further away this is a guy a little bit further away. Well, the answer is actually will be quite different, right? So, you know, I can, I can take nearest neighbor as a, as a solution, right? I can take, or I can take, you know, this guy as a solution. Um, it will be give me two different solutions, but you know, that's gonna be a solution. That's true. That's gonna be an answer. So that's one of the ways. It's a very simple model, which says, in order to answer the question, take nearest neighbors. It's actually called nearest neighbors. Uh, you know, regression. Absolutely correct. What else can we do? Um, we can At actually- least squares, maybe. Hmm? At least squares. Yeah, we can do, okay, before we go to least squares, yes, we're gonna go to least squares in a second. But before that, there is an even easier solution, right? What I can say is, look, you know what? Let's just take this data and uh, calculate like average for it, right? which is very, very simple, right? Let's say, you know, I don't know where average is gonna be somewhere here, right? Um, like mean or median. And then I'll say, okay, it doesn't matter what X is, my answer is this, always. Can I do that? 
Well, I mean, as, as a first approximation, why not? So we already have like two very simple algorithms. One is nearest neighbor. Second one is, you know, this sort of average. Um, and the third one, like you, you, you're proposing, um, we can do this trend line in your regression. We can try to, you know, draw a line like this, for example, right? And then say, okay, look, if it is, um, if the value is, is right here, right? Then I go to this line, see what it is, and then that's my prediction, right? Now, then the question you can ask is like, oh, wow, this is a good idea, but maybe I can be even more accurate, right? Be more precise. So uh, maybe I can just follow, you know, this sort of, yeah, you know, more precise. Okay, well, that was too far, but more precisely data, right? Would that be a good idea? Probably not, right? Now, maybe, 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 I don't know, but maybe uh, we could actually, for example, instead of doing that, maybe, you know, straight line is still a little bit too much, but maybe, you know, something like that, a little bit smoother, maybe that will give us a better answer, right? That's possible. So in any case, what we need to be able to do is out of all those models, we need to select the one that will work the best, right? So for each of those models, we need to estimate the quality of the prediction that this model gives us. And then, you know, based on that, choose one model. It can be the straight line, it can be average, it can be nearest neighbors. Excuse me, it can be, a, you know, anything. So let's talk about this, how we can actually compute this and uh, how we can select the right one. Okay. Oh, actually on this slide, you know, I wanted to show this. This is a correctly computed, by the way, you know, least square feet or like uh, linear regression, right? Um, this is sort of the, 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 the right straight line. Okay, so how do I compute? How do I compute the error or, you know, how, how do I compute the quality of, the, of my solution? Let's say the solution, and just for this, you know, explanation purposes, I took the solution to be a straight line, right? Then what you're gonna do is the following. For every data point that we have, we calculate the distance from that data point to the line. So why do we do that? Well, because look, um, the, the meaning is the following, right? So here is, um, oops. Here is a data point I want to predict. In order to, to predict it, I go here. That would be my prediction from the model, but this is the actual value that, uh, you know, for that X existed. So this is, how much I'm off, right? Or here, you know, for this value, I wanted to predict, and uh, I, you know, the prediction from my model will be here. This is the real value. So this is the distance. That's how much I'm off, right? Now, again, I can make my line actually go, my model, I can make it go through all through all this, like actually, I, I, I'm not going through all right now, but um, I can make it go through all the points. And then, all right, whatever. And then on those points, um, the error will be zero. But we know that, you know, if I do that, um, it's most likely when, it, you know, I kind of learn noise in the data. So I want to stay with this, those type of smooth models. All right, so I calculate for every point, um, I calculate those values, I calculate those gaps, right, that misfit, and then I want to add them up. So, and that's how you do it, right? Um, there are a bunch of metrics, um, you know, there is this metric of mean absolute error, where I just literally take this distance, this difference, and add this up, you know, taking the absolute values. Right, so it just pretty much tells me overall uh, how far my, you know, how far I am on uh, from from um, you know the, the data points, 
Or I can do mean squared error instead of actually calculating the absolute value, I, you know, I squared them up. Now, the reason I would usually do the absolute of squares is because um, you know, some of those data points are below, some of them above my line, so some of those sort of differences will, be, will come with positive signs, some with negative signs. I don't want to, them to cancel each other, so I want, that's why I want to take like, the, the distances. But the most popular measure is this root mean square error. This is RMSC. That's what you usually report as the quality metric for your, uh, you know, for, for your regression. And the other very, very popular metric that you will hear a lot is called R squared. And when we talk about regression, we'll come back to this and you know, we'll uh, sort of spend a little more time on it, understand what it is. But you know, for right now, this is a formula. And for you to understand is this, um, you know, what you have here on the top of this formula is really this um, MSE, mean squared error. What you have in the bottom of the formula is in fact distance in between the variable and average. So in some sense, if I draw this straight line, it's the distance in between those data points and straight lines. So remember, we, we, we thought about this horizontal line, average line, as a simplest model. So what R squared tells you is how much your model is better than simple average solution. So instead, if I just throw away everything and say, look, instead of just modeling all those uh, you know, with, with, with a line or with whatever, I just take an average data point. So R squared tells me how much I'm better than average. And if my quality is exactly the same as for average, then um, the numer numerator is equal to denominator and the R squared is zero. Um, and if my model is perfect, it's R squared is equal to one. So this is a metric in between zero and one and tells you how much your model is better than, you know, just taking very simple average. And um, that's why this, this metric is extremely popular. So, you know, you go to any businesses and, and you'll say, you know, I can predict um, your sales and they'll ask you like, what's R squared is gonna be, all right? So that's sort of, that's the stuff you need to remember, okay? Now we're gonna get back to this um, on, on on, on a lecture about regression. This is just sort of the first kind of introduction to the top. Any questions here? Is it correct to use R squared for no, non-linear models? Because I... Yes, you can use R squared for um, you know, non-linear models. That, that's fine, it has slightly different meaning. Uh, but yes, you can use it. Over there, what you would normally do is you compare um, actually you compare um, the predicted versus um, you know, actual value. And then um, you know, it, it's, it's, it should be straight line, right? If, you, if you're perfect. All right. So next is classification. Here uh, we have seen this, this data before. Um, it was uh, you know, like, yes, uh, I mean, my previous lecture, Sepal Petal. Um, here, there is three classes. And the question that I would normally ask in classification problem is the following. If, for example, um, you, know, you find a new flower and you measure uh, you know, sepal and length, I'm sorry, length and width, and let's say it is, oops, and let's say it is right here, right? You know, that's sort of my data point. Um, can you tell me what species this, this flower belongs to? What species does it belong to? Citosa. Yeah, citosa, right? It, it's, it's right, like sits around those, you know, blue dots, right? And, uh, you know, using the same, sort of logic as we done previously, you can, for example, do it by looking at the nearest neighbors, right? If the nearest neighbors are blue, you know. I mean, now, here is a little bit more challenging. What happens if I put it here? If the metric, you know, kind of measure length and, and width of the sepal and it's right there. I think it is a vertical 
But and, it can also be virgin income. But yeah, probably, probably because it, by the same logic, if I try to see who, what's the nearest neighbors, I'll get versic. It's possible. But at the same time, if you notice, this is a huge overlap here, right? In, in between those uh, crosses and, and green dots. And, and it's not very clear, uh, you know, if, if we get some noise in the data or there is no kind of clear separation. Now, if I put it here, it's also not very clear, you know, which one belongs to, right? But, you know, it can be kind of annoying every time to check like nearest neighbors. One of the way to do it, to solve this problem in, in a sort of classical classification algorithm is the following. You try to detect boundaries and you kind of draw a boundary. It can be a straight line or not straight line. And then, uh, you know, it's in this particular case, boundary can help you differentiate in between, you know, other species and those two species, right? It cannot help you separate in between three classes. But that's classification, right? Um, if I, for example, take um, another feature set and um, I'll, I'll look at the et al, then all of a sudden you realize that here within those features, it's actually much easier uh, to differentiate species, right? Because you can say, okay, you know what? Uh, you know, I can clearly split it into like, you know, three zones, for example, you know? And everything, every point here will belong to, you know, Citoda species, everything is here, most likely belong to Versicolor, and here is Virginia. Now, if I do this straight line, I still make, I'll make some mistakes, right? Um, there is those two data points and, and this one that will be misclassified, right? So maybe I need to draw a boundary like that, which of course makes it, you know, very precise on my trading data. But who said that when you get any of the samples of this, uh, you know, two type of flowers, it's actually uh, will not be, you know, somewhere here and my boundary is going to be completely, you know, ruined. So maybe again, there is some, you know, measurements mistake or you know some mistakes when the when the, when the flower was growing um and 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 so um you know it, it will make me sort of overfeed the data so the bottom line is um yeah we can do those boundaries now the question is how do we check the quality of the solution because you know depending on the solution depending on the boundary i draw um i will have different quality right even just sort of leaving apart this idea of, you know, overfeeding and using the simplest model, um, you know, there is this solution or then there is this solution, right? So how can I compare quality? Now, the, in this case, um, yeah, so we're gonna get to the test data in a second. Um, in this case, uh, the easiest way, and you know, we, 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 what we do right now is we actually sort of learning and checking on the same data, right? Um, so the way to do this is, is sort of, again, very, very intuitive and, and very simple. Um, what you want to do is you want to uh, create what's called confusion matrix, right? And confusion matrix for the binary scenario where there are two classes is very easy. Um, there are four possibilities, literally, right? And actually, let me go back here. Um, I'll draw, uh, I'll draw again, sort of the boundary. So for every point, it can be either classified correctly in one class or correctly in another class or it can be misclassified. Like for example, here, if I say that everything right here belongs um, to, to this class, I misclassify all green points. I mean, not all green points, but green points that are on this side of the line. So four options um, where you, know, you predict 
that it belongs to one class and it indeed belongs to that class and that's called true positive. Um, you, you predict that say item does, does not belong to that class and it does not belong to that class. It's true negative and then it can be false positive and false negative. Um, it's also easy to kind of interpret this in terms of let's say, I don't know, alarm or event. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to predict an event. You're trying to predict that say customer is gonna churn out. So you either predicting that the customer is going to churn out within next month, so leave the service, and it will churn out, so it's true positive. You predict that the customer will stay, and the customer stays, you know, true negative. You can predict that the customer will churn, will leave, but the customer decides to stay, and that's, this is false positive, so you said yes, but it, in fact, you know, it's, it's no. And you say that the customer is not gonna leave, but he actually leaves, right? So it's false negative. So I said it's gonna be negative, but it is positive. So when you have this binary type of classifier, this is pretty much all the four options you have. And um, there are a lot of actually interesting metrics that allows you to, that you can compute from this, um, from, from this um, matrix from confusion matrix. For right now, we just you know, look at one of them, which is called accuracy. Now, accuracy is the simplest met metric. It does not always work, uh, but the idea is that you literally say, okay, what's the, you find the ratio of the correct, correct guesses, right? Correct predictions to you know, all predictions. Let's say you know, I'm 70% time correct, which means you know, out of 100 predictions, out of 100 customers, 70 times I guessed correctly, all right? So that's accuracy. Now, we're gonna learn later on that there are situations when accuracy works well. There are situations where accuracy does not work well. Now, but one thing is very, very important to understand that these are metrics both for regression and here for classification. Th those metrics are the quality of algorithm, right? they're not necessarily good metrics for your business problem. You might need to think of how to convert those, these metrics into the metrics that are relevant to your business. Because just by looking at this true positive, true negative, false negative, false positives, um, just by looking at numbers, that's not enough. The question is how those numbers, how they are important for the business. For example, if I predict that the customer is going to churn, but the customer actually does not, right? Let's say this is a false positive scenario. What is going to cost business? Well, it's going to cost business uh, probably extra, you know, you, if you want to do some, so first of all, if you don't want to do anything, it costs you nothing, right? But if I predict that the customer is going to churn and the business wants to keep the customer, you probably give him some discount. So if the customer would stay anyway. Could you translate churn? In churn out. Packing it, we leave, drop the service. Okay, thank you. Uyot, uyot service, churn out. Um, so if you, so if the customer, if uh, the customer churns, if, if, the, if we predict that the customer is gonna churn out, um, and uh, the, you know, the, the business does something about it, uh, but the customer didn't work, she didn't plan to churn out and would stay anyway. Then business just wasted the discount on the customer. No, not a big deal probably. On the other hand, if we predict that the customer does not churn, but then he leaves, that he churns out, um, then business loses a customer and then there is a sort of customer long-term value that business loses, right? So it can be much more important in this case. So it's very much depends on the business situation. Um, or think about, I don't know, coronavirus, uh, you know, detecting, right? False positive, uh, which means there is, you know, no disease, but it detects. Or false negative means there is actually disease, but the, the test missed it. Two very, very different consequences, right? Uh, based on, on, on those mistakes, based on those errors. So within this matrix, every square, can carry very, very different value uh, for the you know, business or, or, or for the application. 
And so um, that's sort of mapping of every square into the value. That's something that you need to learn how to do. Um, and we're going to talk more about this when we talk about you know, practical sort of use case scenario. Does it make sense? OK. All right, now, finally, a um, couple more things that are important. We so far, what we did, uh, we did something, actually, we're doing something bad. We uh, uh, look at the data. We build the model on that data, right? We did this re linear regression on the data. And then we verified the quality of the model on the same data. Now, that's not a good idea. And the right way to do this is to actually split the data into two pieces. Split it into the training piece, so where you train the algorithm on, and then test piece where you verify algorithm on. So why, is this, why do you want to do this? Well, the test piece is the one that you never show to the algorithm. It's like with a, um, you know, with a quiz, right? There are some questions I can show you, and so you train on them, but then there are some to, vary, to check how well you, you, know, you learn the material. I cannot test you on something you've never seen before. Because you know, otherwise, you could just as well, as I said before, memorize things, right? Or you know, it's going to be unfair sort of uh, metric. So what I want to do is I want to take part of the data and hide it. And then I want to you know, run the training and then test it or verify the quality on both training set and on the test set. So on training set is literally, I'm just checking how well you, you, know, you, you can answer the questions that you already know how to answer. On the other hand, on the test set, I'm checking how well you're answering the questions that you've never seen before, right? So training kind of checks you know, how well you memorize things. Testing checks how well you generalize. Now, you can actually make your algorithm perform 100% on the training set by you know, memorizing it. But then you'll perform terribly on the test set. Now, doing other way around is extremely hard. And so what you usually try to do is you try to find the right balance. Um, as, as you notice, for example, you know, if we overfit, so if we completely follow the, the, the data points, we, on the training set, on the same data points, will show perfect result. But on new data points, we most likely will make significant mistakes. If we draw a linear regression, say, through those points, then even on the test set, we'll make mistakes. It will not be perfect. But on the training set, I'm sorry, on the training set, we'll make mistakes. It will not be perfect. But also on the test set, we will, though we will not do perfectly well, we'll do better than on the previous memorized um, solution. Um, again, this might sound a little bit sort of abstract right now, uh, you, you, one of the things we'll do in the homework is actually you'll try to overfit the data and you'll see how, um, you know, algorithm that performs really well on training will fail dramatically on, on test, right? Again, training is think about it like you're memorizing answers, you're perfectly memorizing answers, but you never thought about what the hell you're memorizing, right? When you come to the test of the class, you fail it. Um, though you would answer perfectly you know, all the answers that you, the, all the questions that you have seen before. On the other hand, you might not memorize precisely the answers that you have seen before, but you understood the logic of the, you know, the subject, right? You learn the subject, then you come, and then you can think and give the right answers, maybe not perfectly, but you pass the test, all right? So that's the logic there. Now, um, if we just split the, the data into this training and testing set, and training is usually like 70% of the data you spend on food on training and 30% you know, on testing, it feels like you're wasting uh, a little bit of the data. Plus, um, you know, there is some luck in terms of how you select training and test set. Again, the right way to do this is, for example, would be to randomize the data before splitting it. But still, you, know, you might get sort of lucky or unlucky, right? The same way as you on the exam. You, you pick up a few, you know, you pick up a few questions that you actually just know well. So in order to avoid that, 
um, you know, people came up with this notion of uh, cross-validation, where what you do is you multiple, you, you, you train your algorithm multiple times. Each time what you do is you split your data and you take one piece that you use for, for test and the other for train. Then you use some other piece for test and you know, the rest for train. Then you use some other piece for test and the rest for train. So that's called cross-validation because uh, uh, actually called like K-fold cross-validation where those pieces are folds. And uh, that's what you see here. So for example, you know, five-fold cross-validation is when you take your data, you select piece of it for testing, um, you, know, you train the data on, on, the, on that piece, you test on the small piece, then you train on a different piece, test on a different small piece, et cetera, et cetera. And then you average out the results. So that will give you much better, much more stable um, you know, performance of the algorithm. You pay the price of actually, instead of uh, training algorithm once, you, you, know, you, you train algorithm five times, but you know, the results would be better. Um, so that's the cross validation. So finally, um, you know, typical supervised learning, typical supervised learning pipeline consists of two steps, right? Model training and then model application. So when we train the model, uh, we take the input and we take the label. And if it is classification, it's label. If it is um, regression, some value. We generate features. And uh, today at the discussion, uh, you know, at the, at the lab, you will learn how to do that. And then, you know, you train uh, the machine learning algorithm. And then when you do prediction, or you put it in production, well, you actually have to do the same thing. You have now a new data point. If you generate features, you, know, you, you, you have to generate it exactly the same way. Then you send it to the model, and then it generate, gives you an answer. So that's like sort of very generically, uh, quite generic uh, you know, pipeline. Now, if you go a little bit further and just think about overall workflow, right? Um, there are three steps. So you prepare the model, I'm sorry, you prepare the data, which is, you know, you define the problem, you get the data, you know, you understand, you clean it, and you get it ready for modeling. Second part, you actually build the model, and that's what we talked about today, right? You, you know, you do some feature engineering, and then you train the model, and then you test the model. And then the last thing we haven't talked about today, but we're going to talk a lot about those things uh, during the use case studies, is to understand what actually our solution means for business. Um, so what kind of changes you can make and how you can actually monitor and improve on those models. Because honestly, you know, the first two parts, you know, this prepare data, model and predict, do not bring any value to the business whatsoever, right? And most of the time in the companies, nobody actually even cares about those pieces. It's you as a data scientist will need to be able to go through this and build the model. Business cares about the last part, right? The impact. And so the question is how what you build actually can impact the business, all right? Okay, and to, um, you know, for, for the last slide for today is actually there are a couple more books. Um, if you're sort of interested in the topic of machine learning, um, there are a couple, you know, actually great books. One is Introduction to Statistical Learning. This is a book, um, you know, from Stanford University. And in fact, um, there is online course um, on that if you want to go deeper and um, statistical learning actually means machine learning. It's um, just, you know, again, the book written by statisticians. So, um, you know, they like to call it statistical learning, but this is actually a very, very good, very fundamental book. And the other book is uh, this machine learning learning. It's sort of a new book uh, by Andrew Ng. Um, he, Andrew Ng is a you know, big fame of, of machine learning cor course on Coursera, the first course that ever been there. And he's one of the founders of Coursera. So it is more of like, you know, I think it's like 60 practical advices in terms of how to build machine learning models and what to look at. Um, so, you know, the, again, the left book is more of sort of theory. Um, the right book is, is more of practical advice. Uh, you know, both are available online for free. So, you know, if you're interested in the subject, I recommend you to, you know, look into those books. And with that, um, with that, we're done. And I think we're right on time. Any okay. questions? All right. Um, I think we're going to you guys are going to have our seminar in 10 minutes. And please, those who are listening but not showing, you know, without cameras, please be ready next time to turn on your webcam. I want to see more faces. Yeah.
Happy <laughs> face. Oh yes, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I have All a right. question. Can I ask? Yes, sure. About uh, train test structure. So imagine we have train uh, and test, so we uh, choose the best model uh, by, some, by some uh, accuracy. So should we for production uh, train our model for all uh, data, train and test, or uh, state only train? Yeah, usually what you do, you either do cross-validation when you go to production, or you train for the entire data that you have. Um, and then, you know, put it in, in, in place. Now, the biggest, the biggest challenge there is, uh, you know, to make sure that your model, I mean, there, there, there is a big part of this is to make sure that your model operates well in production, which means you will have to monitor the quality of this and retrain it regularly. But that's sort of what you typically do. So in cross-validation, in the end, uh, we should uh, train on all data. Yes. Yeah, you train on entire data. You just sort of, you, you know, you train on, on the, you know, say if with cross-validation, typically people do either five-fold or 10-fold cross-validation, which means you take 10% of the data, you hide it as a test set, um, then you train on 90%, um, you know, on 90 or 90 or 90 or 90 or 90, right? And then um, that's what, that the model, um, then it averages out, and that's the model you use um, typically in production. Or again, you, you know, you might you might just train it on the whole thing if you're comfortable with it. Yeah, uh, and I have a question about cross validation, if you allow. Uh, are these, uh, for example, five or ten chunks uh, of data are predetermined from the very beginning, or do we like randomize them, uh, take a random sample ten times? If there is no time access in the data, then you typically you know shuffle the data, you randomize it. Now there is, if you have a time access, then you know there is a very particular way how you do this um, cross validation, um, not to kind of what's called create signal leakage, where you kind of put into the you know kind of sort of look into the future, right? So you, you don't want your verification data be behind be before um, the you know the before the in, in time before the data you use for training. Um, but other than that, yes, you shuffle the data, then you do. Um, uh, cross validation. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you in a week. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.